you don't, the fact of the matter is that you don't know. What you do have is years of experience. What you have is maybe a good, good understanding of the product and the client and the, you know, the, the structure in which you work in, but you don't know everything. Hey, Packaging Peeps, it's Valley Montes on Packaging Unboxed. Today, I'm super stoked to share this episode with you. We are talking to creative director Jaime Cabrera. His book, What's the Big Idea? An Indispensable Guide to Becoming a Kick-Ass Creative Director is available now on Amazon. You can check out the link that's in the show notes. We get into so many different conversations in terms of what it takes to become a creative director. Like, how do you get there? And what do you do when you get, what do you do when you become one? Plus, how do you manage up to a creative director if you're a junior designer? Jaime's book is meant for anybody that's aspiring to become a creative director, or maybe this is like your first year as a creative director. The truth is that if you don't really have a mentor or somebody that you can talk to about what it's like to be in that position of a creative director, you're gonna get a huge dose of imposter syndrome. It happens to everybody, it happens to the best of us. But that's why this book is so important. Before we get to it, do me a huge favor, subscribe to the channel, leave us a review, leave us a comment, wherever it is that you're listening or watching this episode. Anything you'd love to learn about packaging, let us know. This episode is brought to you by idpdirect.com, the only factory direct packaging manufacturer that specializes in sustainable retail packaging made in their own factories, which is going to save you a ton of money from having to pay distributor markups. If you need to buy packaging, check out idpdirect.com. This episode is also brought to you by specright.com, your packaging specification management platform. Why would you want this? Well, it's going to streamline project management. It's going to standardize your design processes. It's going to manage all your documentation among a million other things. If you're buying packaging already, check out specright.com. You can manage all of your packaging, especially if you've got like a high number of SKUs. And this Packaging Unboxed podcast episode is also brought to you by packdora.com, P-A-C-D-O-R-A.com, the online packaging design platform that's going to allow you to create production-ready dye lines and 3D renders in seconds of thousands of packaging constructions. If you need to design packaging, check out packdora.com. And last, if you want to catch me live, I'll be speaking at Paris Packaging Week, January 25th and 26th. And I'll also be speaking at Packaging Premiere in Milan, May 16th through the 18th. Thanks so much for joining us. We've got uh, Jaime Cabrera. Well, before you give us a quick rundown on yourself, thanks so much for being on, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, man. Thank you. Elio. Did I say it, did I say it right? Because we were having a conversation about name <laughs> pronunciation and how important it is to us. So I said it right, right? Evelio. Yep, 100%. Evelio. All right. Yeah. Love it. So Jaime, can you give us a, a rundown on who you are and what you do? Uh, so my name is Jaime Cabrera. I'm a, um, a veteran creative director, uh, having worked in the business for probably, man, close to 25 years now for a variety of different agencies, uh, doing all kinds of different types of work. I, I sort of cut my teeth doing uh, TV spots um, for for cable, which is which is kind of a, a madness unto its own, <laughs> which I can tell you some other time over over beers. Um, to producing radio, to jingles, to uh, content, to experiential, to really any any number of of things. I've sort of I've kind of done it all. Uh, but uh, most importantly, I'm a I'm a dad to two uh, awesome <laughs> boys, and uh, I have a beautiful wife. I live in Long Beach, California. Uh, I host a podcast called uh, Confessions of a Creative Director, and I'm about to launch a book on the same subject of being a creative director called What's the Big Idea? An Indispensable Guide to Becoming a Kick-Ass Creative Director. So I guess <laughs> to summarize, I am I guess I'm a creative director at heart, and that's what I love to do, and that's what I love to talk about. So sure. Like really, what's what's their job? What are they supposed to do? And two, like what's the real path? To getting there right so that's that's the goal here is like we're going to kind of dig into some of this stuff so sure. that's a great question and that's a question that i usually ask of all my guests right because everybody sees the role a little bit differently and i love i love metaphors because they help me understand things uh, a lot uh quicker and a lot um you know a lot easier and you know people have described it as being a conductor to an orchestra right the conductor doesn't actually play any instruments but he's helping all the other people uh, play their best performance, right? So he, depending on that person's energy, right? 
they're driving the tempo, they're highlighting people to do a solo, right? They're elevating the horns to play louder or whatever it might be, right? So some people have described it as a, as a conductor. Uh, one of my favorites is, a, is somebody said, it's like being a caddy because you're not playing, but you're helping folks select the right club. You've played the course, you know that it's going to dog leg right or that, you know, they should, you know, the, the, the greens are fast, so they should maybe, you know, make this adjustment. So it's really, um, you, you're sort of moving from a star player to becoming a coach or as somebody else said, a player manager, right? Because you still, you still want to get in there and get your hands dirty and create, but you're really more of a, of a manager of creatives. Besides managing, what's the sole responsibility of a creative director? I think the, the sole responsibility is to make the work better and make it mm -hmm. as, as strong and effective as it can be. That really is, if you had to summarize what the job is, that's really what it is, right? So that could be anything from reviewing work and giving feedback and recommendations that, that are gonna, that's going to make the work stronger or more effective, right? It's going to help make the work more on, on whatever the brief is. Um, and, you know, it, it could also be um, setting the, setting the tone, right? So that's mm -hmm. the whole brief briefing process, which is, I think really probably the most important part is making sure that that first initial instruction is as accurate and as, um, uh, you know, as descriptive and as you know, deliberative as it can be, right? It's it's like look at this brief. It's telling you exactly what we need to create, right, to achieve these goals. If you work with an agency, and every agency is different, right? There are some agencies where brands want to work with an with agency X because of the creative director. They're a known entity, sure. And there are other agencies that you want to work with because you know the work that comes out of there where the creative director almost takes a back seat and pushes the work forward. I would like to think that, um, you know, the creative director, it's, it's kind of one and the same, right? Mm -hmm. If the, if the creative director is doing a good job, um, the work should be, the work should be really solid. And I think that oftentimes the creative directors that you don't see or hear about are probably maybe even better, right? Because they're right. not wanting to take the limelight or they're not wanting to take the credit because at the end of the day, it's the other people that are doing the, the work. Right. Yeah. So in some ways, maybe that's better that you don't know <laughs> who the creative director is, but the, but the work is really good. Cause that means that hopefully he or she is, is providing all the direction and helping shape the work, but letting the teams, you know, run with it. And at the end of the day, take the final credit because mm -hmm. they created the work, right? This person helped right. shape it, shape it, helped, drive it forward. But, uh, but, you know, there is that whole mythology, right. Of, of the yeah. creative director, right. Which is, which is super strong in, in, uh, uh, I don't know if I would say the culture, but it's super strong and kind of like, like yeah. you mentioned earlier, right. In, in TV, you think of Don Draper, you think of right. these other people that are super charismatic and, and own the room and stand up and just speak eloquently off the cuff and the, and the client stands up and, <laughs> and claps and signs the, you know, signs the, right. uh, signs the, uh, you know, the contract and, yeah. you know, so there's that kind of mental picture in our head, but I would say some of the best creative directors that I know are, are, are quiet, are mm -hmm. reserved, don't necessarily love that part of it. Um, but they help drive really great work. Do you think it's still a reference today? Do you think Mad Men still is a reference for anybody under 30? That's a great question. I hadn't thought about that. Our creative director, Don Draper. He's not my first creative director. I think there's still some lessons to be learned from knowing that show and that character. But that's a great point. I mean, I wonder if there is a, you know, if somebody out there is developing some new version of that, because I think it, you know, it probably exists, but now it's more like uh, these entrepreneurial leaders, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's Gary V or somebody like that, yeah, that like, somebody's modeling a show after. I don't know. Yeah. Or like, yeah. Like Chris Doe, you know, is that, is that the, uh, yeah, I've had Chris Doe on, on my, YouTube. my show. Yeah. yeah. He's awesome. Yeah, no, he's great. Um, so how do you how do you become a creative director? Do you can you go to school to become a creative director? Can you graduate as a creative director? Like, how do you get there? Another great question. I, I don't know that, that that's true. And that's one of the reasons why I started the podcast mm -hmm. and, and, and eventually wrote the book, because I felt like I could have really benefited from 
some understanding of what the role would require. Um, I don't think that they, that it is the case that you can graduate as a creative director. I don't think so. I think you sort of have to work your way up. Typically, you know, you are working your way up and there's two different routes, in my opinion, to mm -hmm. getting there, right? You can come in as, and be sort of a writer, which is more of what I am. I'm more of a conceptual writer thinker. I'm not a designer. Um, and then there's a designer, right? More of coming in through the visual side. So there's two sort of paths that that you can take. I've learned to art direct and I've learned to mm -hmm. recognize, you know, good design and how to how to, you know, art direct, but I'm not a designer. I couldn't do it myself. So there's sort of two paths, which already makes things tricky because you could get somebody up in the role of creative director that came up through the visual part that may not understand the conceptual part or, you know, or vice versa. If I had to choose one and I'm being biased because obviously I'm a writer, but in my opinion, I, I feel like the best creative directors are the ones that understand language and, and, and writing and words. And then if you understand, then you can, you also have an understanding of, of the visual side of the design side, man, you're, you're unbeatable. But if I had to choose one skill set, that would be it. And, and you'll, I'll probably piss off part of your audience. But to me, that's the most, because once you have, and I was just talking to the, to somebody about this, right? The idea, the concept, the one word sentence to me is the most valuable thing, because then if you can nail that, then everything else will f flow from it, right? The design should be able to flow from this one written idea. Um, so I think, you know, personally, I think that that's, you know, the, the, the stronger side. And then um, to your question about, you know, some people getting to that point and realizing that it's not for them or maybe somebody else realizing that they're not good yeah. at it. Yeah, that, that can be super tricky. And it is an ego thing, right? to get to the creative director and you're like, yeah, I've arrived and you realize, <laughs> oh shit. Yeah, this isn't, hey, I don't like this. Yeah. Or this isn't for me or somebody worse. Somebody else says that isn't for that person. And then what do you do? I, I yeah. interviewed a guy named uh, Peter uh, Claves from, um, he's now in, in, uh, I think he works for FCB now. He's a copywriter. And mm -hmm. he talked about wanting to be thinking that he wanted to become a creative director. He got to that role and he was like, I lost the smile. He, he was so sad. He was like, I lost the smile that I used to have going into work every day. And I realized yeah. that it wasn't for me. And he, he said, he told his boss, like, I just want to go back to being a copywriter. And he did. And he's, and he's super happy. And, you know, you can still make, if you're good at your job, yeah. you're still going to be able to make the money. Right. And maybe you're, you'll never get to that title, but if you're happy, it's like, who cares? And you've got to, you've got to be able to tell a great story. So a lot of designers, I, I tell them, you've got to learn to write. Like you have to, you know, take a couple classes, you know, go to the copywriting course uh, online, yeah. like just start figuring that out. Yeah. Uh, two things. So mm -hmm. I, I would recommend this book. Um, it is called self self. Uh, I think it's called self help for copywriters by Dan mm -hmm. Melkin. I'm, I'm actually interviewing him here pretty soon. Um, and then the other thing too, that's interesting to, to think about is, you know, I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've seen all this stuff going on. It kind of died down a little bit, but it was super hot on LinkedIn for a while. This, this whole thing around mid journey and AI, <laughs> yeah. right? So I talked to some folks on the, on the podcast about this. Like, isn't it interesting that mid journey runs on words, right? And the people, in my opinion, the people that mm -hmm. know how to articulate the language part of it. They type it into the computer and it spits out these images. Granted, maybe it's not quite there yet or it's it's missing yeah. some humanity or whatever, but it's getting pretty damn close, right? So isn't it interesting that it comes down to language and the people that are going to be able to feed the, com the, the, you know, the, the computer what it needs to hear and gener to generate these images, I feel like they have a leg up, right? So wow. again, that goes to your point about being a, being a writer. That just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> as a, you know, as I'm, as I'm goofing off in, um, you know, in mid journey and I'm talking to designers, you know, I, I, um, I reached out to this guy in Liverpool and he's creating like some amazing things on mid journey. I'm like, what are your prompts? Like, what are you doing? And he's like, dude, it took me like six months to just figure out the prompts. 
and you know he sends him he sends him over he's like don't share them with anybody because it, it's like you know it's yeah. like gold i'm like wow you I, know it's hard for a designer to get there but you're right as a, as a writer like that's just every day yeah it's like breathing. i mean so, so the the one of the original ones or one of them one of the things that got a lot of press was somebody had i think created a cover for a magazine mm-hmm. using ai and it, if i remember correctly it was like an astronaut or something and it was sort of like a low angle shot and the thing that caught my eye or caught my attention was that the use of the word swagger or something like that. And it said, some, I think the prompt was something about an astronaut walking on the moon with swagger. Right. right. And that word changed everything. Cause if it just said walking on the moon, right. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get an image, but you instantly understand what swagger is. Right. You in- instantly understand how a person's body position might be when when they've got swagger and that changes everything. So again, language, right? Somebody that doesn't understand language might have just said walking or somebody might have said walking confidently, okay? Getting close. Right. But a swagger, yeah. that's a different that's a whole different idea, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. That's nuts. So talking about <clears throat> AI and I know we want to focus on creative director, but I've got you here so I want to talk to sure. you about writing too. Um with AI, it's funny. I, I built an entire like forty-page site using Jarvis, so it's an AI copywriter. Oh, oh, really? Right. Okay, which is, which is nuts. But it was, you know. Oh shit! Now I'm gonna get pissed off. <laughs> now I'm gonna talk out of the outside. Computers will not overtake. No. Okay. No, That's I want to know about this. I want to hear about this. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, you you um you know you go in and you you type in who you want to sound like, and how many words you want to use, and what are the keywords, Ooh. and it writes in that person's style. So just like you can oh my God. prompt mid journey to, to output something like Picasso, you can do it on Jarvis and say, you know, I want you to write like, I don't know, pick your, pick your favorite, uh, commercial copywriter. Right. That's funny. Yeah. Isn't it funny that I'm not aware of that? Like what kind <laughs> of bias is, and I think I have heard of it maybe briefly now that you mentioned yeah. the name, but isn't it funny that I haven't ex- experimented with that, but here's the, here's the thing that's even, crazier right and maybe this will blow your mind too is you know people talk about ai and the moment that it becomes i think the word is sentient which which means that it's self-aware so now you got a computer or you know a program that understands how to create art from words and you've got a computer that knows how to generate words and now really (laughs) you know will they just will they just take over and like nobody will need any of us anymore and they're just going to be like creating their own you know advertising for us so back to create so back to creative directors yeah. so it sounds like you know if you're if you're at that early stage you should be really comfortable asking more questions and having more answers a good creative director creates an environment that's really safe for people to contribute for people to ask questions for people to be able to push back and say, Hey, I think we should try it like this. I think that that, you know, creative director that's really good makes that possible, which then should allow people to be able to feel comfortable saying, Hey, you know, I'd love to try this. Would you be open to that? Um, You know, or, or just in general, being able to kind of push back and, and try new things. Right. Um, But I do think that there's probably a lot of creative directors that, are are like no this is my way this is yeah. you know my way or the highway and the moment cuz at the end of the day look if if you, if you as a creative director knew everything and had this perfect solution for it, for everything what are you doing in that role you should be a billionaire you don't the fact of the matter is that you don't know what you do have is years of experience what you have is maybe a good good understanding of the product and the client and the you know the the structure in which you work in but you don't know everything, especially now with, you know, everything. I mean, it seems like every few days there's some new trend or some new thing on TikTok or Instagram or whatever. There's no way you can understand it all. So as younger people are coming in and they're telling you and you're not willing to listen and say, OK, well, I don't understand it, but, but you know, play it out for me. How could it work? And if you're not willing to listen to that A and B every once in a while, take a chance on it, then I think you're going to go, you know, the way of the dinosaur and you're just going to be obsolete. 
you can't know you can't know every time what's going to work right all you can do is make um calculated risks right so if you have a, a young creative that's super passionate about this idea and they you know they keep coming back to you with it and, and at a certain point you got to okay you got to go okay there's something there must be something here let's try it and as a creative director, you have to take the final responsibility, right? This, this is just another thing that makes it for a bad creative director, right? Is, is a creative director that wants to take all the credit when things are good, things go well. Yeah. And then they don't want to take any of the blame when things are not, you know, it's like, if you signed off on it, you're like, I don't know about this, but you seem really passionate about it. I've done the research. It looks like it could work. Let's try it. And if it fails, you don't tell your client, yeah, sorry, client. It wasn't me. It was, you know, young yeah. so-and-so that wanted to do that. You go like, yeah, I signed off on it. Mm -hmm. We tried it. It didn't work. And then on the, on the flip side, then you can have the conversation with the younger client. And it's like, hey, it didn't work this time. Doesn't mean we're not going to try it again, but let's try to make, you know, better calculated risks next time. But you have to take the responsibility if it, if it doesn't work. You know, you mentioned being in front of the client, you mentioned contracts and stuff like that at the very beginning here. So is a creative director, do they also need to be a salesperson? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think they need to know how to sell creative and how to pitch creative for sure. Yeah. And that's not for everybody, right? As I mentioned, there's some creative directors that are sort of reserved and maybe that's not their thing, which is not to say that if you're selling creative, you have to be super animated and, and whatnot, right? Yeah. Um, cause I have, I've known some creative directors who are very quiet or very soft spoken who can sell things all day long. It's almost like that, that quietness sort of draws people in. Um, and then I've seen others that are super charismatic and, and have the same results. But I do think that you need to figure out your personal way of doing your best to sell something. But yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's part of the, I think that's part of the gig. Um, I will say that. You definitely need to have a very good account uh, person that's that's working with you to sell it. Yeah. Um, and I think as a team, you can kind of, you know, fill in the blanks for or fill in the weaknesses for the other person. But I think it's a team effort, right? Because a, a really good account person will help you get it across the yeah. finish line. If you're a designer working with a creative director, what's the best way that you've found to manage up? Yeah, I talk about this in 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 my book a little bit. It's it's about critical thinking. What happens a lot of times in in our world, right, is we're moving so fast, and uh, you know, depending on the size of the shop and the client and all that, a creative director could be pulled in many different directions. So they have limited time. So they're maybe not going to give you everything in a perfect world up front, let's say with a, with the brief or, or, you know, setting you up. So what I think what, and this been, this has been helpful to me is just applying some critical thinking and saying, okay, you know, my, my creative director has been able to set aside that much time. I got a pretty good brief, but there's some still have some questions. I'm going to apply critical thinking and come up with something that I think will work. And I'm going to make a plan for it. And I'm going to, I'm going to put it down on paper, which is key, which, uh, I can talk about more in a, in a second here, but I'm going to put it down on paper and then I'm going to get in front of the creative director and say, Hey, thank you for the brief. I know you didn't have a lot of time to talk about it or give a lot of directions. I think that I've got a good handle on it and here's what I came up with and here it is on paper and let me walk you through it and my thinking and why I thought this way and take up, take the initiative to put something down on paper, because if you wait, you're waiting for more direction. A, I think it's a crutch and I think it's, it's an excuse. And B, you're going to lose so much time that it's going to make things because the, the client's not going to care that you couldn't get in front of your creative director. They're going to want the work when they want it. Right. So you get it down on paper. You think through it critically and say, I don't know if this is right, but I took a stab at it and I and I would love to walk you through it. And then the creative director, you've saved him or her a lot of time. They're going to get, they're going to look at it and hopefully it's, it's, it's good or it's close. And if not, then that person's going to be able to say like, this is good, but this needs work or, you know, God forbid they say it's completely wrong, which it shouldn't be the case, but 
um, you're going to be that much more ahead. And I think, I know I am impressed when this happens, your, your, your creative director is going to be like, man, this person took the initiative. They, you know, took the information they had, they applied critical thinking to it and they came to me with a plan. And that is like worth its weight in gold, in my opinion. Yeah. A brief can change you know, as much as we hate it. Sure. Sometimes a brief can change. And if you're, if you're putting something down on paper and you're sharing that with your creative director saying, you know, this is what I, what I felt and you walk them through that, you're also giving them an opportunity to see what the results are or how somebody's understanding what they put down as this brief, you know, they may go back and say, Oh, I understand why you got to this point. And there may be some, you know, tightening up or, or redirection yeah. that needs to happen. You say the time, time, time and you are also showing your potential, right? You're also showing the potential like, wow, this mm -hmm. person is a critical thinker. They took the initiative. This could be somebody that works their way up to be me, to be the you know creative director or something like that, right? So yeah. you show <laughs> the initiative. I, it may not be for everybody. Yeah maybe personality rise, but you should try to, if this is not your, you should at least try because at the end of the day, it's also only going to make your life better as let's say the designer, because if you wait, right, to, to get more detailed information or feedback from your creative director, you will have lost time. The deadline's not going to change. So guess what's going to happen? You're going to be as right. a designer or the, the copywriter, right? You're going to be the one that has to you know, pull an all nighter to, to get it done to meet the deadline, as opposed to getting in front of it sooner and, and, you know, getting the feedback that you need and going from there. In your book, you talk about keeping your creative bank account yes. full. How do you do that? Whether you're a creative director or designer, how do you keep that? Yeah. Account so it's this stocked? idea called creative capital, right? And, and my thesis or my uh, hypothesis is that creatives have sort of this this bank of creative capital in their in their head. And like you said, it's like a bank account. You use that capital as you're designing things and you're, you know, creating things and 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 whatnot. And it starts to get depleted. And in my opinion, the only way to kind of replenish that is A, if you're doing this work, let's say for an RFP, right, to win business, is that you actually win the business and you mm -hmm. get to do the work and you see your your idea and your vision come to life that it's like, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, it's kind of like you, you're, 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 you're starting to see it, you know, rain in your bank account. You're getting, you're getting that you're replenishing that. I think the other, another way to do it is by giving people an opportunity to recharge. And that may mean literally a day off. It may mean, Hey, uh, why don't you and the team go to, the Meow Wolf exhibit or go check out this art thing. I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay for it. And they replenish that because they're like seeing things and they're getting excited about other things. And they're like, you know, rebuilding that, that capital. So I think it's, it, you know, I like that idea because I think everybody can understand when you're overdrawn. Right. And it, it just hopefully will help people remember like, this isn't a, yes, I guess in theory, it's a, it's an infinite resource creativity, but on an individual level, you'll burn somebody out and, and they will be depleted if you don't take care of them in, in those ways, right? Help them win the business, help them see their ideas come to life, help. That's where the selling comes into play, right? Help sell through those ideas that they're going to be able to see, wow, I, I made that. Uh, or give them opportunities to replenish that through experiences, through time off, through, you know, sending them to a conference, whatever it might be make that, uh, make that investment. So as a, you know, creative director, you're going to not only be selling, right. You've got in, you've got external sales and internal sales. You've got to make sure that you personally are keeping your creative capital up as well as your staff. But then there's the other part of it, which is like the hiring and firing part of this. What's the right way to do this? I talk about this in the book as well. Um, but the thing that I like to do is you have, you have to be very resumes can be um, tricky in one, one way or the other, right? Somebody that 
looks great on paper in real life and it's happened to me is not good and vice versa there's some people whose resumes you know don't really tell a great story their titles are maybe different but they can produce you you know that at the end of the day they might be able to produce great results so the first step is like really applying a critical eye to looking through resumes and portfolios and you know information that you get and being able to say like hey this person isn't a isn't called a creative director but they sent me some of the some of the work that they've done and I spoken to them and I think they could be or you know it, it's it, it, so you a you got to do your due diligence and look at their materials and and whatnot obviously you're moving in a fast pace so you have to make sometimes some split you split second decisions if you're looking at a bunch of stuff but if there's something catches your eye dig a little bit deeper you might find something interesting um the second thing is I I am a big believer in the test assignment, and I agree it is completely wrong to ask for work to for for real work. So I always we always make it sort of uh, you know um, a, a, a fake project or a fake brand or something. And what I try to do is I try to make it so that it's not super heavy lifting, um, and we limit we limit it. We say we just want this to be on five pages. We're going to give you a finite amount of time because that's also key, right? It's like if you give somebody three weeks to do something, you may not get a good sense of how, you know, how quick they are or, you know, how, what kind of critical thinking they have or whatever. But if you say, hey, let me know when you have, uh, you know, 48 hours to do this assignment, I'm going to send it to you, right? So that's the other thing is we try to time it. So it's like, okay, we're going to send it to you on Friday, send it back on Monday. We just want to get your thoughts on this. And typically I'll provide like a little sheet that has like some facts and figures, right? On the target audience or the, or the market or whatever. And then I'll give them sort of like a little bit of a brief and I'll say, give me a, um, an experiential concept that delivers on these things. Or if it's a design project, it's like, how would you design? I think I've done a t-shirt thing, right? It's like, how would you design a t-shirt or what would your design for a t-shirt be that supports this initiative or whatever it is, you know, but, but make it, make, make it so that it's not, you know, super taxing. Cause I think that, I don't think that's fair. And I, I, I think that that's, you know, I don't, I don't think that's too much to ask. Um, you know, although there is, there's been, I think one, on one occasion where we did do it as a, as a, a real assignment and we did pay for it. We did say, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to give you X amount of money to do this. Because we were trying to kill two birds with one stone on that one. Um, but yeah, we did pay for yeah. it because I, I do agree that's a lot to ask for. Yeah, you know, I've got a I've got a bunch of friends that are that are chefs. And in the kitchen, like one thing that they do is when you're being hired, you know, if you make it through the interview process, if you, you know, if you're at that final stage, they'll ask you to come in and prepare a meal and they'll just give you this is the ingredients we have. Yeah. Or, you know, give us a four course meal. Love it. And it just show, you know, and it just shows one, it shows like how, how clean you keep things, how you yeah. organize yourself. Again, it's that, it's that thinking you want right. to see the thinking in action. Right. I love that. So, I, I, and, and re- side note here, I don't know if you've been watching, have you, have you seen the bear? No, on, I haven't. On Hulu. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a show about a, about this kind of like troubled chef. Highly recommend it. Highly, highly recommend it. Great, great show. <laughs> But I, I love that analogy. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. that that's also probably one that goes up there with being a, a creative director, right? Is you're kind of like, you're not necessarily cooking, but you're designing, helping design menus or you're preparing the ingredients or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Um, this is how back, this is how backwards I am on TV. Actually, I just started watching The Office. I don't know if you've heard of it, <laughs> but it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's a good little show. That's a good little show. Oh yeah. It's great. Yeah, I just started like this week. I started watching The Office. Um, That's awesome. So you also talk about in your book, you talk about thinking conceptually before tactically. Yep. Like, like what is what does that mean? What's sort of what we were talking about um, mm-hmm. earlier, right? It's about before it, somebody in 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 that I interviewed on my show and is in the book. Mm-hmm. It's a veteran CD. His name is Ed Miller. Says if you can tell me what the idea is in a few words, then 
and I understand it and, and I'm excited by it, you've got mm -hmm. a concept. If you have to show me things, then it's likely an execution, right? It's, it's a tactic. It's like, hey, here's what's, if you can't tell me what it is in a few, in a few words, then it's not, um, you know, a concept. And that's what I mean. It's like, let's think about what is, what is the concept before we get into execution. So I'll give you another great example from, from the book. I interviewed a creative director from GSDNM. Her name is Lee Brown. And she was telling me about uh, something that they do when they're coming up with TV spots. And this particular assignment was for a Super Bowl spot. Okay, so you can imagine the competition and the pressure within yeah. the agency to come up with this. And she said what they did was before they started, because some people come in with full scripts and storyboards and, you know, she said, what we did was we came up with a premise and it's literally a few words on a piece of paper. And it's just the premise. It was a premise for a commercial. And this particular commercial, I remember it because it was so it was so awesome. Was it was it had to it was for Super Bowl, it was for avocados from Mexico, <laughs> right? Which is tough already. Yeah, and they wanted it to have a football vibe, right? So the concept that they came up with was so clever, and the, and this was the premise. The premise was what would it look like if we went back in time to the very first draft of the world, right? You know, the NFL has their draft where they pick players <laughs> and whatnot, but this was the very first draft of the whole world, right? So you have these people, I guess it was, it was sort of like, you know, it was sort of like God or, you know, this, this like yeah. council of people deciding what countries were going to get what, <laughs> right? So it was like, yeah. um, you know, uh, China, you know, China is on the clock and they select spices or whatever it was right <laughs> and then when it got to mexico it's yeah. like you know mexico selects the avocado right and then like australia got the sloth or i don't know it was really really <laughs> clever but that was the premise yeah. the premise was what would it look like what did the very first draft of the whole world look like and that's funny you get that right as a as hopefully you yeah. get that as a creative person you're like oh my god that's amazing so just by signing off on that premise, then they went to work and, and started scripting because they could have gotten a number of ways, right? But it was just that, con that concept first. They didn't need to have a whole script yet. That will come because if you get the premise and the premise and the, and the concept excites you, then every, you'll be able to get to a great solution. But if the concept doesn't excite you and it's not interesting, then, you know, really who cares? But that one has stuck in my head. It's like, oh my God, I love that. It's just like, let's just talk about the concept. With the next pick in the first draft ever, Australia selects the kangaroo. Yes. And Mexico selects... Beach, 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 beach. beach. The avocado! Great pick. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah. No, I, I love that example because as you're explaining it, I'm already laughing. It's a, it's a great concept and going in a million different directions visually, but... If it if I don't like the concept, I'm not even going to think about how many ways it can go. I'm like, all right, right. how do we how do we end this? Um, yeah, it's it was so good. And she said that they yeah. did that. That wasn't you know the only one they did, but that's the way that they approached it. It's like let's not worry about that. And and guess what? Think about how many concepts or premises you can come up with versus okay, we came up with one thing and then the and then the team spent all night writing full treatments for it and, and commercials and we made visuals and yeah. we did this, that, and, and how many are you going to get versus we're just going to focus on this part. You know, if you, if you're, if you've got a good team, you could come up maybe with, you know, who knows any, any yeah. number of it, as opposed to like, we went all in on this thing and you're going to, you know, die on the cross for it and it sucks and nobody likes it. And then what you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's great, man. Um, so as we're wrapping up the book is what's the big idea. Yep. I'm super stoked about this. If I order the book and I read this book, what is the one thing that you want me to get out of it as a reader? The biggest lesson I think I would want people to walk away with is I guess two things. I start the very first chapter. You get, you get one. You oh, get I only one. get one. Okay. Right, right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Okay, I'll do. I'll do two. 
So the first one, I, I start the I start the book with this chapter, and I, it's super odd, mm -hmm. and I recognize it's super odd, but I start the, the book by talking about imposter syndrome because my hypothesis is that if you can't get over imposter syndrome, and, and then what I call the lizard brain, and other people call the lizard mm -hmm. brain, you're not going to have success in this role because yeah. you're going to have a lot of self-doubt. You're not going to have confidence. You have to be able to, to get over that. And then the second, the second thing, and this is probably the big takeaway, is that there is no magic bullet, no magic process. You have to kind of figure it out for yourself. And it also depends, obviously, on your own personality, but it depends on the type of work that you're doing, the type of agency that you're going to be working at, you know, the number of people that you're going to be overseeing, what type of those people. So I, the big takeaway is like, there is no magic bullet. All you can do is prepare in the best way that you can and apply that critical thinking. And here are some ideas. Some of it is, you know, principles and more theoretical stuff. And some of it is nitty gritty, like try this, try this for mm -hmm. your next uh, ideation. I hate brainstorming, by the way. So I use the word ideation and, and the, the, the concepts around ideation, right? So it's, it's kind of like part theory, but then it's also some things that you can employ right off the bat. So I, I would say that that's the big takeaway. It's like buckle in. There's not an easy, uh, you know, follow these steps and you're going to get there. Um, yeah. It's going to take exploration and it's going to take learning, but you're going to be much better prepared just by reading this short you know, 120 page book, because it's going to give you all the high hard ones that you need to think about and consider as you step into the role. Nice. Nice. Are you, uh, are you self publishing this? I am. Yeah. Awesome. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, this was one of my goals, uh, for the mm -hmm. year and I didn't want to delay and, you know, and I know that it's a, it's kind of a long process to try and fi find a publisher. And I said, I don't want to wait. I want to try to get it out there. I want to try to help people so I'm going to self-publish and, um, you know, I'm excited about it. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's a guy out there. I can't remember what his name is, but he's got a website. It's called copywriting, copywriting course, I think is what it, what it is. Um, and yeah, he self-published this book on how to be a copywriter. Yeah. How to, you know, it, I mean, it's, I think maybe 30 pages. Wow. And, um, he charges like five bucks. He's like, I, I want to give it to, away for free, but you got to pay for shipping. Yeah. And, um, his whole thing is like, just how to write for emails, how to write for, um, conversion. Like just yep. really, really, I know who niche. you're talking about. Yeah. I, I heard, I heard this guy on a podcast. I think I know who you're talking. It's like how to write. It has a funny title, right? Like how to write. Yeah good or and, something like that. And there's like, and there's typos in there, you know, and he just like cranked it out. And, um, it it's amazing. I think self publishing is the best way to get best way to go. Um, you know, you're not looking for anybody else to distribute your, your book. Uh, I think if you're a designer out there, start writing. So you know, get out there, put your stuff out there. Uh, I think it, it it helps. Yeah, you have um, to just last, get it out. You just have to get it out there. Yeah, yeah. Last last question. Yep, I can do this As all day. At, by the way, I'm having a blast. So. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Um, at the, since we're at the end here, what is, you've seen a different, you know, I've seen a lot of different people critique work, you know, as it gets to the very end of the of a project. Um, there's been ways I've seen a professor at art center, which I didn't attend, but there's a professor there that was famous for rolling. The young. work would come in. Yeah. I don't have to say it. Right. Yeah. So what would he do? Take the work and just rip it up, throw it across the room, berate you. Yeah. And, um, and that was it. And if you didn't rip it up and throw it, throw it away, you were, it was like a success, right? There's yeah. like that extreme. <laughs> no, and I, and I love that. Either. I just describe it and you already know. Yeah. And then there's the other way, right? I, yeah. I think my personal experience is you're going to get much better results using kindness and empathy mm -hmm. and uh, understanding and, and constructive criticism, you can still be direct and you can mm -hmm. still be pointed uh, and you can still be challenging. But I, I don't, I think a great, it makes for a great story. And right. I've talked to some people <laughs> who have, who are, who are with him. And, and I think it's, 
you know, become part of the ethos, but they didn't end up that way. I was just talking to Will Chow from who oversees all of Whole Foods. They're kind of in-house agency and he was his student and he hasn't employed that and he's been very successful. So I think it makes for good sort of like <laughs> character development. But I, I personally think yeah. you get the best by, you know, by being ki as kind as you can, by being as empathetic as you can, by asking, you know, questions and, you know, by giving good, solid feedback and allowing people the room to make mistakes because mm -hmm. that's the only way that you're going to learn. And, you know, obviously it's, it's okay to make a mistake. It's not great to repeat it, especially if it's some kind of like, you know, technical mistake or whatever. But I think that that's a better way to go. And on the flip side, you don't want to be fake. You don't want to give, if something is not good, you don't want to say that it's good just because you mm -hmm. want to be nice. That doesn't work either. Yeah. But I think you just have to approach it from, you know, from the, from the kindness way that the kindest way that you can give the feedback in the most empathetic way. Uh, so Jaime the Cabrera, you know, thank you so much. The book is what's the big idea. Um, and that's going to be available soon. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be out on black Friday. I'm going to try to do a pre-order here pretty soon so that people can pre-order it, but it will be out on uh, black Friday or cyber Monday whenever you want to buy it. But, yeah, I'm hoping that uh, that people uh, that people pick it up and that they find it useful. And again, my end goal is to just help people, you know, uh, be the best that they can and get fulfillment out of their work. And if I can save somebody a, a little bit of heartache or a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, trouble from from preparing them for this role, I feel like I will have done my job. That's awesome. And where can they get it? So they can go to Amazon, I'm sure. But where do you want them to go? Yeah, Amazon is the place to go. It, it's that's the best place to find it immediately. Hopefully, it'll be available in other spots after that. Uh, there will be an ebook version as mm -hmm. well, and I'm currently working on the audiobook uh, version. So you know, there, there'll be a number of ways that you can that you can pick it up. Awesome. You're not going to have like a what's the big idea dot com website where we'll redirect. So, uh yeah, you can find, uh, you're going to be able to find all the information at Jaime Cabrera creative dot com. Perfect. Um, I'm going to have obviously a link to the book. Uh, I am also going to offer, um, you know, coaching, uh, individual one on one coaching for mm -hmm. people that are uh, aspiring to be creative directors or are in the role already who need a little bit of help. It could be, you know, reviewing work or helping them prepare for a pitch, whatever that might be. Also for for agencies, more of a consulting type of role so they can find all that information. I'm also going to make tools available on the site, like mm -hmm. uh, creative brief tools, or, um, you know, I talk about this document in the book called an A3 that I really like, make those things downloadable. So I want to provide some value, some extra value for those people that, that purchase the book. Amazing. I mean, thank you so much. I appreciate you being on. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, man. I really enjoyed it. I seriously could, could do this uh, all day. So thank you, Abelio. I hope you learned as much as I did from Jaime. We'll talk soon. Connect with him on LinkedIn and myself. We'll see you soon.